Good morning. Welcome to our service here on the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. God's Word today reminds us that life with God, life following God here and now is it's not always sunshine and roses, and sometimes it's that way specifically because we follow our Savior. And yet the Lord promises to be with us, to, to give us the strength we need to, to meet those times, and ultimately to bring us through them safely to our heavenly home. We begin this morning with the hymn, Not Unto Us. Please stand. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of that forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world, so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first portion of God's Word for our consideration today, the words of Genesis chapter 39. We read selected verses from that chapter, and here we hear of someone who was put in a position where they needed to follow the Lord, and yet there were were consequences to that decision. And yet it was still the right thing to do because Joseph knew the Lord and loved the Lord and trusted that the Lord would take care of him whatever happened. Joseph was well-built, handsome. Sometime after all this, his master's wife had her eye on Joseph. ...with anything that's been entrusted to me in the house... He's put me in charge of everything that he has. He has no one in this house greater than I am, and he's not withheld anything from me except you because you're his wife. How then could I do such a great evil and sin against God? She kept speaking to Joseph day after day, but he would not listen to her. He would not lie down beside her or even be with her. But one day he went into the house to do his work. None of the men of the household were there inside the house. 
She caught him by his garment and said, Come, lie down with me. He left his garment in her hand and ran outside. She kept his garment beside her until his master came home. This is what she told him. The Hebrew servant whom you have brought to us came to me to put me to shame and said to me, let me lie down with you. And look, when I screamed and cried out, he left behind his garment with me and ran outside. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, this is what your servant did to me, he became very angry. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison where the king's prisoners were confined. So Joseph was kept in prison there. But the Lord was with Joseph. He showed mercy to him and gave him favor in the sight of the warden of the prison. The warden of the prison made Joseph responsible for all the prisoners who were in the prison. Joseph was responsible for whatever they did there. The warden of the prison did not pay attention to anything that was under his authority because the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord made everything that he did succeed. This is the word of our God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 22. We sing the psalm together. Our second lesson, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, we read verses 24 through 26. 
Hebrews 11 is a chapter outlining a number of great heroes of faith and how they lived their life by faith. Here the reminder is about Moses, that although he had power and wealth in the world's eyes as a prince of Egypt, he chose rather to be counted among God's people with everything that came with that at the time. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter when he grew up. He chose to be mistreated with God's people rather than enjoy sin for a little while. He considered disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. This is the word of our God. Alleluia. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Alleluia. Please stand in honor of the gospel. The gospel according to Luke chapter 9. Here Jesus has a conversation with his disciples about his true identity and his true purpose. Jesus also reminds us then that uh, to understand his identity is to understand ours. And what comes for Jesus, we also expect in its own way to come for us too. One time when Jesus was praying alone and the disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others say one of the ancient prophets come back to life. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. He gave them a strict command not to tell this to anyone. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law. He must be killed and be raised on the third day. Jesus said to all of them, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Praise be to you. We confess Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our next hymn.
Grace be to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our particular consideration this morning are the words of our gospel lesson, Luke chapter 9, where Jesus has this discussion with his disciples about identity and what flows from that identity. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, they say, of course, that a picture is worth a thousand words. There are some pictures that don't need any words. We see them and we know exactly what they're about. We know exactly what they're meaning to, to share with us. You look down at someone's shoes and you see that little swoosh. It's Nike. Everyone knows it. Everyone's seen it. You're on your summer vacation. You're in, headed down the interstate and you look at those signs that are way up on those really tall poles and you know which restaurants are at the exit, sometimes miles before. You see those golden arches. Oh, they got McDonald's at that exit. You see that kind of mermaid looking thing and you all oh, Starbucks they got Starbucks there and you don't even need the words all you got to do is see the picture and you know what it's talking about we have that in a spiritual sense maybe if you took a, a couple of moments and you just looked around here this morning wonder how many crosses you would count. I have the large one on the wall, of course, just above the altar. But all over the place, and it's purposeful, it's intentional, all over the place, these little signs and symbols of the cross. And we don't just do it in our, our worship space. We, we do it in our day-to-day our -day lives. We, we have the, the earrings and we have, I wear one. Right? And you might have one that you wear. And again, it's, there's no words needed. We see it and immediately we think Jesus. Jesus. As believers, we, we fill our lives with it. We see it all over the place. It's a sign, it's a symbol of who we've put our trust in. Because that's the place where he accomplished our salvation for us. But it's the mark of a Christian not just to recognize the cross, not just to physically have a cross either on their body or in their house. But Jesus, as he has this conversation with his disciples, he very clearly links the two together. To be a Christian is to have the cross. But not just the symbol. Not just the, the thing that's it's kind of a nice decoration in my hallway or even hanging from my car mirror if you still do that kind of thing. But that I actually carry the cross. I bear the cross. It's with me. And not just that it's with me, but sometimes the, the weight of it presses hard. It's a struggle to carry that cross, to walk behind our Savior. It's not always the, the image of the cross, the picture of the cross that we, we want to have. We, we like to, to keep the, the, the pretty, the, the decorative, the, the version that just makes us think about the nice stuff. Jesus is my Savior. 
Jesus rescued me. And then so often we, we have this image of the cross, and we even kind of scrub it of its gruesomeness. You can just kind of think in your, your day-to-day life. When you see crosses, how many of them have a body on them? How many have the, the suffering Jesus, the Jesus in pain, the Jesus about to breathe his last? Again, that's not the image that we like to conjure. It's there, we, we acknowledge it, but even then, we'd, we'd rather have the one of afterwards, the one where he's not there anymore, the one where he's come back from the grave. And we do rejoice in that. But that weight, that struggle, it's not always the place that we like to dwell. And yet for Jesus, that's the point that he needs to make with his disciples. That's the thing that he wants them to focus on. Because he asks them, again, what the opinions of the, the crowd are, who, who do people say that I am? And they come up with a couple of different answers. People have come to their own conclusions, come to their own thoughts about who they think Jesus really is. Some say John the Baptist. They'd perhaps heard that John had been executed and, and maybe they thought John had been brought back. Others say Elijah. There had been promises through the prophets that Elijah was going to, to be the, the forerunner of the Messiah. And so rather than understand or know Jesus as the Messiah himself, they thought, all right, maybe, maybe this is the, the guy who comes right before. He's a spiritual teacher. He's, he's kind of doing all these things. Maybe, maybe the Messiah is right around the corner. Others, one of the ancient prophets, come back to life. Maybe they thought it was Isaiah or Jeremiah or Hosea or whoever. But Jesus takes that public opinion poll and turns it around so that he could have that more deeper conversation with his disciples. So, so who do you say that I am then? And Peter, on behalf of the group, says, you're the Christ of God the chosen one of God, the one set aside by God. Peter's got the right answer. They've correctly identified the identity of the one standing in front of them. But then Jesus tells them what that really means. It doesn't mean going down to Jerusalem and kicking the Pharisees and other religious leaders who had things a little bit off, out. Jesus wasn't going to be the, the, the battlefield general, the, the one leading the charge to, to get the, the Romans out of the promised land. Wasn't even going to be the one who was going to have everyone come to him. Jesus very clearly says, no, this is what the Christ, the chosen one of God, is here to do. He's going to get rejected. He's going to get killed. For Jesus, in the future, lay the cross. After the cross would come the glory, the resurrection, but for Jesus to be who he was, for Jesus to be who he had come to this earth to be, the only path, the only way to, to go through was the cross. To have that weight, to have that burden, and everything that went with it. Jesus didn't try to avoid it. He didn't try to escape it. 
He didn't try to, to come up with his own solution, his own plan, some sort of spiritual cushion that he could put on his shoulders to, to kind of lessen the blow as he bore it. He says, this is who I am, and this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm about. And then Jesus tells his disciples, if it's this way for me, then it's this way for you too, as my follower. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Notice what Jesus says there. Take up his cross. Not take up my cross. Not, not make sure you've, you've got that symbol hanging somewhere. But no, that weight, that burden, that struggle that comes from belonging to me. Accept it. Be ready for it. Embrace it. That's a hard teaching. Because our natural inclination is to avoid it and to do things to minimize it. Sometimes outright just not pick it up at all. Rather do the thing that makes life comfortable Rather do the thing that makes life easy. Rather do the thing that makes life just not hard. But Jesus tells us that it is going to be hard when he tells us that it's self-denial. Our natural inclinations, our natural thoughts about how to, to take care of ourselves, sometimes... They're in conflict with what it is to serve God. We heard it in our, our Old Testament lesson. We heard of Joseph. Right? Already by this point in Potiphar's house, he's already had a rough go at things. Already had his own family, his own brothers have to decide whether or not they were going to kill him or sell him. So he's sitting down at the bottom of the dry well. Finds himself sold into service. And just when he's maybe kind of settling into that role, now his boss's wife is coming after him. Easiest thing in the world to say, hey, here's something that's going to be good for a while. But what does he do? I can't do this. I can't. And then all the fallout that comes from it. I had false accusations. Now he's in prison again. It would have been so easy for Joseph to just kind of roll with what his boss's wife wanted. He followed the Lord and paid the earthly price for that. Now it might not be a situation quite like that. But we face similar things. We face those things where there's following the Lord and knowing that fallout is likely to come and just kind of rolling with that situation, letting it play out the way that other person or the way the rest of the world thinks is the easy way to go. And, and it takes self-denial to say, no, I'm going to follow the Lord instead. Jesus makes it clear, though, it's not just these kind of one-time, you know, special event type things where you look back, at year, look back on it years later and go, wow, I was really at a turning point in my life, or I was really at a crossroads. And he says, this is the regular habit of a Christian. This is the struggle that we're committed to when we roll out of bed each and every morning. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The Christian life 
as our Savior demonstrates it to us and teaches it to us, is a daily struggle. Daily struggle to put God first. Daily struggle to put His ways above our ways. And we, we can't be lulled into the thought that somehow we're going to get to this place in our lives when it's not a struggle anymore. It will always be a struggle. In fact, if you find yourself in a place in life where it does, seems like you're not struggling so much against sin anymore, that's the time to stop and pause because maybe it means we haven't been struggling the way that we need to. Maybe we've been overcome by sin and just didn't realize it. But because our spiritual enemies, because the devil, the world, our own sinful flesh is constantly trying to, to push us away from our God, we're constantly swimming against the stream. That's our identity as Christians. But when we look at our Savior, when we see that that's the life that he came to live too, the life he came to live first, the life he came to live in our place, it gives that symbol all its meaning and all its power. Because when he went first, when he faced that struggle, when he didn't turn away or turn aside from his cross, it meant that he could be that perfect substitute. It meant that he could take that place under the full weight of our sin and guilt and by breathing his last and dying to wipe it away. To be able to say, it is done. It is finished. We do, day by day, have this struggle and yet we are assured of victory because of who we are. And we are who we are because of who Jesus is. Peter answered, you are the Christ of God. That involved suffering. That involved the, the pain of the cross. And Jesus promises that our lives will not be free of it when we follow him. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Jesus says, trust me in this. Follow where I lead and you will not be let down. You will not be disappointed. Jesus isn't giving this to us as a reward, though. He isn't giving this to us as, well, you, you did such a good job of sacrificing. Now I'm going to make up for it in the life to come. But rather, he says, because you're with me, because you're mine, because you have this connection to me by faith, now you have everything that's been set aside for you. And we keep all those blessings when we keep our eyes focused on him, when we keep following where he leads, even when that path is away from what seems like the easy path. And all along the way, in front of us, as we follow, we, we see that symbol of the cross. We recognize it right away. We know in an instant what it means. It means Jesus. That's where he is. That's where he's going. By God's grace, that's where we're going to. And so we do cover ourselves in those symbols. We, we wear them. They're, they're all over our homes and in our vehicles, everywhere. We do it so that we do remember what our Savior went through. We remember then also the struggle that we've been committed to as we follow him and the power that the Lord promises to give us to meet those challenges, to meet those struggles 
all so that we can one day look back on it all. So we live with our God forever in heaven and say thank you. Thank you that you brought me through. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Now may that peace of God which goes beyond all human understanding guard and keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may be seated for the collection of the offering. Please stand for prayer. As part of our prayers this morning, we come before the Lord on behalf of our sisters in Christ, Sonia Korthals and Georgianne Minster, both of whom are hospitalized. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for reconciling us to yourself through the sufferings and death of your dear Son. Through him, we have confidence to enter into your presence and to bring you our prayers and petitions. Out of the infinite bounty of your goodness, grant us a rich measure of your Spirit. Let the love of Christ fill your church so that it may flourish in all good works. Help us show love and compassion for all who are in need. Bestow on the nations of the earth the knowledge of your mercy so that they may turn to you, the only God, and find salvation in you. 
strengthen our faith so that we, we willingly put aside self and follow wherever you lead. Help us always to daily take up our cross. Help us also to unfailingly come to you in prayer for all of our needs. Give a special measure of your power to those who are sorrowful or mourning, to those who are in pain or sickness, to those who may be in temptation or peril, that they may receive your blessed aid. Help us patiently endure any chastening or afflictions you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you're using them in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which is ours for all eternity. Compassionate Father, in your mercy you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care, but we pray especially for Sonia and Georgianne. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance if their suffering must linger. Help them find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach them to trust in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Dear Lord, accept our prayers and intercessions. Provide for all our needs, not because we are worthy, but for the sake of Jesus our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
You may remain seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. With sins forgiven, assured of eternal life through the cross of Jesus, our Lord, receive his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. Couple of announcements. Uh, well, first of all, encouragement to take a look at the service folder because there are quite a few in there this week. Uh, just a, a couple to, that are kind of related. Uh, first announcement in the service folder, my, myself and my family were going to be headed out of town for a couple of days for, for family vacation. Uh, so leaving this Thursday and then coming back the, the following Wednesday. If you are in, in need of immediate uh, pastoral help during that time, Pastor Rich from over at St. John's will, will be the one to contact. His phone number is there in the service folder. Uh, I'll be gone next week. There will be a guest preacher, but our, our team uh, that kind of handles some of our, our technical things and the, the streaming and everything uh, will also be, be out of town, and so there, there won't be a live stream of the service next week either. Uh, one other thing that is not happening today, and it's uh, again not printed, our, our baseball camp that we have been doing the last few weeks today will be a week off from that as well. So if you had been thinking about coming this afternoon, you can certainly come uh, and, and throw the ball around and everything, but uh, won't be organized baseball camp here this afternoon. 
And then one other time-sensitive thing or time-related thing. It was mentioned last week, but you have a special insert this week giving you some more information, some more details about the, the homecoming happening at Alma College, that they'll be hosting our Martin Luther College for that. The, the congregation there, Good Shepherd in Alma, is, is hoping for some responses from area congregations by July 15th, just so they can start to get a ballpark number of who might be joining them for that. And so the, the sign-up sheet for that, if again, if not necessarily that you're committing for sure you're going to go, but just that you're thinking, yeah, that sounds interesting to me, that sign-up sheet is, is on the bulletin board over by the school entrance. So I encourage you to, to take a look at that. Again, I encourage you to take a look at the, the service folder. There's a number of other things there as well. May God bless your week.